Anyway, if you grab your Bibles and we'll turn to Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 1 through 21, joy in believing. So Philippians chapter 3. Joy in believing. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you again is no trouble with me. It is a safeguard to you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcisions. For we are true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus, to put no confidence in the flesh, Although I myself might have confidence, even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness from which the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and I may be found in him, not having a righteous of my own, from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it or have already become perfect, but I press on, so that I may lay hold of what, for what I also laid hold by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many are, perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in the following of my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have for us. For many walk, of whom I often have told you, and now tell you even with weeping that they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which, from, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ whom will transform the body and our human state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of his power that he has even been subject to all things to himself. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we just ask you again that your Holy Spirit would just be amongst us. As we look at your scriptures, Lord God, and we look to you for all things. We just ask you that you bless our time. We thank you what you'll do here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beware, beware, beware. Three times Paul cries this out in the second verse. Beware, beware, beware. This reminds me of growing up at home. Don't touch the stove. Don't run with scissors. Don't run out into the street. Don't sit too close to the TV. My dad always said that. I don't know why. Don't talk to strangers. Don't play on the ice. Do you know how many times I've fallen through the ice here on Chipotle? If 
five or six times <laughs> every year. Salt water and ice, not good. But I just want to go out there and test it. Don't play with fire every year, exactly. Don't play with fire. Any other things that your parents told you growing up? Turn the lights off. Turn the lights off. That was an energy thing. Turn the lights off. Cindy Ebley said, don't talk back. What else? Chew with your mouth closed. Close your door and when you go to the bathroom? That's a good one. Someone else said in the earlier service, don't pick your nose when you're on stage. <laughs> it's funny when you got the kids up, up there on stage and they're doing the weird things and the wacky stuff. That's kind of the, kind of the fun stuff when you're having a play or something going on. The kids, you know, you got there. <clears throat> But Paul, as a safeguard, Paul reviewed all these basics with the believers. The Bible is our safeguard, both morally and theologically. When we read it individually at home and publicly in church, it alerts us to correctedness that we need to make in our lives through our thoughts, our attitude, and actions. In verses 2 and 3, we talk about these dogs and evil workers they were very likely Judaizers, Jewish Christians who wrongly believed that it was essential for Jews to follow the Old Testament Jewish law, especially submission to the rite of circumcision in order to receive salvation. Many of these Judaizers were motivated by spiritual pride because they invested so much time and effort in keeping the law. They could not accept the fact that their efforts could not bring them a step closer to salvation. Paul criticized these Judaizers because they looked at Christianity backwards, thinking that they could cut themselves or mutilate the flesh to make them more believers rather than the free gift of salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking about the cutting of the flesh, and I was remembered about Elijah when he was talking about the different gods, they were actually worshiping Baal. Elijah had the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, hey, let's set up two altars and let's sacrifice an animal, put them up there. And then we'll see who rains down fire. This is actually from 1 Kings chapter 18. So they built the altars and from the morning time to the noon time, they were yelling out and screaming out to Baal and Nothing was happening. Then Elijah finally said around noontime, hey, maybe your God's not, you know, sleeping. Scream louder. So they were screaming louder, and they were cutting themselves and doing all sorts of weird things all the way till the late afternoon. So again, can you imagine from the morning time till 12, nothing happening, but I guess just praying and asking for God to bring down this, their bail, bring down the fire, to not to nothing and nothing happening until the afternoon. So finally, Elijah decides to rebuild. He had to rebuild his uh, altar. Uh, they sacrificed the animal, put it on top. He actually had 12 stones at the bottom of the altar for the 12 tribes. And he also got a big ditch and circled that out. Then he asked them to fill the four jugs of water. And they filled that up and they drenched the altar. And they actually did it three more times. And then Elijah called it to his God and asked him to bring down fire. And it came. And not only did it destroy the animal, but it destroyed the altar. It destroyed all uh, 12 stones. And the entire water was evaporated, all gone. So uh, they definitely saw that there was definitely, Elisha's God was the true God, and they uh, all decided to, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. So what believers do is a result of faith, is not a requirement of our faith. This had been confirmed by the early church leaders at Jerusalem Council 11 years earlier in Acts 15. Who are the Judaizers today? They are those people who say that you must add something to this simple faith. No person should add anything to Christ's offer of salvation it's all through grace by faith. 
And it's easy to place more emphasis on religious effort, the confidence in our flesh, than on the internal flesh. But God values our attitude of our heart above all else. God notices all that you do for him, and he will reward you for it. In verses 4 through 6, at first glance, it looks like Paul is boasting about his achievements. But actually, he's doing the opposite. He's showing that the human achievements, no matter what we achieve in this world, it's in, it's, um, it's not right to get your faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. It cannot earn a person's salvation with the Lord. Paul did have impressive credentials. He had a great upbringing, nationality, his family, his background, his inheritance. However, this conversion of his faith in Acts 9 wasn't based on all that he had done, but on God's grace. Paul did not depend on his deeds to please God, because even the most impressive credentials fall short of God's holy standards. Are we depending on something with our faith, or are we totally abandoned with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you on the faith tales of your Christian parents? Do you belong to an affiliation organization outside the church or even being part of the church? Putting money in a basket won't get you to heaven. Or just being good won't make you right with God. Credentials, our accomplishments, our reputation cannot earn salvation. Salvation only comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So why did Paul, a devout Jewish leader, persecute the church? Agreeing with the leaders of the religious establishment before his conversion, Paul thought that Christianity was unorthodox and blasphemous because Jesus did not meet his expectations of what the Messiah would be like. Paul assumed that Jesus' claims were false and therefore was wicked. In addition, he saw Christianity as a political menace because it threatened to disrupt the fragile harmony between the Jews and the Roman government. In verse 7, Paul talks about his gain. He's referring again to all his credentials, credits, and successes. After showing that he could beat the Judaizers at their own game, being proud of who they were and what they've done, Paul showed that it was a wrong game to be played. Be careful of considering past achievements so important that they get in the way of your own relationship with Jesus Christ. This is a great statement about values. A person's relationship with Christ is more important than anything else in this world. To know Christ should be our ultimate gain. Consider your values. Do you place anything above your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ today? In verse 9, we see that the amount of law-keeping, self-improvement, discipline, or religious effort cannot make us right with God. Righteousness only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are made righteous, receiving right standards with the Lord Jesus Christ by trusting on Him. He exchanges our sins and our shortcomings for His complete righteousness. Sometimes, again, I always talk about these scriptures or little memos we need to have on our mirrors. Jesus Christ exchanges our sins and our shortcomings for his complete righteousness. Hallelujah. In verses 9 and 10, Paul gave up everything. He gave up his family. He gave up his friendship and his freedom in order to know Christ and the resurrection power. We, too, have access to this knowledge and to this power but we may have to make some sacrifices along the way. Are you willing to give, what are you willing to give up in order to know Christ? How about a crowded schedule in order to set aside a few minutes each day for prayer and Bible study? Do you need your friends or your family's approval to know Christ fully? What are some of your plans? What are some of your pleasures? Whatever it is, knowing Christ is far 
better. When we are united with Christ by trusting in him, we experience the power that raised him from the dead. We, read, we sang that song, there's power in the name of Jesus. That is so true. No matter where we are, no matter what circumstances that we could be in, just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll be there to help us. That same mighty power will help us live morally renewed and regenerated lives. But before we can walk in newness of the life, we also must try to die to sin each and every day. Just as the resurrection gives us Christ's power to live for him, so his crucifixion marks the death of our old sinful nature. And again, we are bombarded every day with Satan just giving us fiery darts, and we have to try to let those fiery darts fall. You're going to need to put on the armor of protection. I talked about that before. Your helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the spirit, belt of truth, sword of the spirit, and shield of faith that he would protect us from these fiery darts. And every day we must try to die to this sin. In verse 11, Paul wrote, In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, he was not implying uncertainty or doubt. He was unsure of the fact that he would meet God whether by execution or by natural death. He did not doubt that he would be raised, but the realization of it was that it was in God's power and not his, no, not his own. Even for us today, as we get older or whatever, we're not sure how we're going to pass from this life, whether it's going to be a sickness or disease, could be a car accident, who knows, but that's all in God's will. I pray that it would be nice if God came back, heard the trumpet, just meet him in the air. That would be fantastic. But again, God has that all worked out. Just as Christ was exalted as after his resurrection, we will one day be exalted in Christ's glory. Paul knows that he might die soon, but he had the faith that he would be raised again after the world and being raised up in heaven. In verses 12 and 14, Paul says that it was his goal to know Christ fully, to be like Christ, and to be all that Christ had for him. This goal could absorb Paul's total energy. But this is a helpful example for us. We should not let anything take our eyes off the goal in knowing Christ. And I think again, knowing about what we do in life, what's our goals. When we're young, if you guys would uh, run, there's stuff that you can prepare to, to run and to work out. I was actually thinking about driving, coming home yesterday from Virginia Beach. Oh my gosh, those people down there are crazy. They don't use their blinkers. You try to give yourself some extra space in between cars, but then they think, oh, well, there's extra space, so we'll just pull right in front of you. So it's like three inches. I'm like, what the heck? That's not like I know, something like that. It's worse down in Virginia, though. It's crazy. They don't use their blinkers. I mean, I said to Colleen, I'm like, do people just... And then you got like four-lane highway, and they just like, vroom, over to the exit side. I'm like, what the heck? But driving, if we take our eyes off the road for a couple of seconds, what could possibly happen? We could possibly be in an accident. So we have to stay, you know, vig vig vigilant? Vigilant? There's a word. We got to stay paying attention to the road and make sure we're not going to be swerving off to the right or left. So we really have to pay attention. But the same thing, we can't take our eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to continue to, you know, come to the, to the worship services to worship the Lord and get filled that way, to read God's word and be filled that way. Um, you miss it when you go away. And then when you come back, it feels good to come back home to Grace Calvary and be part of the church again. So we must try to lay aside every harmful thing that forsakes anything that distracts us from being effective Christians. So what is holding you back today. In 13 and 14 verses, Paul had reason to forget what was behind, and he held the coats of those who stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr from Acts 7. We, all, we have all done things in the past that we are ashamed of, but because our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can let go of all the past guilt and look forward to what God has for us to become. It's funny, when we went to CBN after the um, broadcast was done, they took us for a tour, and they actually had some paintings there. And they actually had a painting of um, Paul 
uh, watching Stephen being stoned. So it brought back the part of, you know, him holding the coats and watching this go down. I mean, later after his conversion, he probably was sorry for that. But it was very interesting. Up in the very corner of the painting was a picture of Jesus almost ready to come down and say, Stephen, let's go home to paradise. So again, don't allow your past to, you know, get in the way. Satan, again, likes to use those fiery darts. Jesus has forgiven you for whatever's done in the past, present, and uh, we need to move on. So don't dwell on your past. Instead, grow on the knowledge by God, by confronting, concentrating on your relationship with him now. Realize that you are forgiven and then move on to a life of faith and obedience. Look forward to a fuller and more meaningful life because of our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, how do we grow? We come here Sunday morning, we listen to God's word. If you guys can, you know, read the daily devotions that are there for the morning time or evening time. Get involved into a Bible study. Pastor Dan would love to see you guys on a Wednesday night here at 7 to 8. There's also a comedy hour of Pastor Dan too, so it's not boring. So, uh, yeah, so you can do that. And again, if you guys have questions about your faith or something you're struggling with, you can talk to somebody who's mature in the Lord and ask about their opinion or whatever there. So that's how we uh, grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 15 and 16, sometimes trying to live a perfect Christian life can be difficult and leaves us drained and discouraged. We may feel so far from perfect that we can never please God with our lives. But Paul used this perfect to mean mature and complete, not flawless in every detail. Those who are mature should press on to the Holy Spirit's power, knowing that Christ will reveal and fill any discrepancy between us and what we are and what we should be. God fills in those cracks. That's pretty neat to think about. Christ's provision is no excuse for lagging devotion but it proves or provides relief and assurance for those who feel driven with the Lord. Christian maturity also involves acting on the guidance that we already have received. What we learn, we have to put into practice. We can always make excuses that we have so much to learn, but the instruction for us to live each and every day and how to live it out is already right here in our Bible. Do you realize we have everything, you know, everything that we... The truth is all right here. We just have to open the Bible and look to his word. In verse 17, Paul challenged the Philippians to pursue Christ's likeness by following Paul's example. This did not mean, of course, that they should copy everything that he did. He just stated that he was not perfect. But he, forced, he focused his life on being Christ-like, and so should they. The gospel probably wasn't in circulation back then, so he couldn't tell them to look at the Bible and read about Jesus Christ and how to live our lives. Therefore, he urged them to imitate him, that Paul could tell the people to follow his example as a testimony to his character. Can we do the same? What kind of character are we outside these walls Monday through Saturday? What kind of follower would a new Christian become if he or she imitated you? I thought about that too. Again, we get out into the world and, you know, I hope that being a Christian that we wouldn't use some of the foul language or we wouldn't be able to smile at a crude or, or dirty joke, you know. People still watch you and make sure that you're walking with the Lord. Again, we're not perfect. We're just born again. But... uh but there's a reputation. You were ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ out there. And um, so I pray that we wouldn't partake of that. Stand up for what the Lord has done. And then someone, someone might, might day, one day might say, hey, there is something different about you, and I'd like to know what that is. Why do you have peace in your life? I, that happened to me. I was bringing my Zoe to the groomers for years. And uh, Michelle, she's like, you seem calm. You seem cool. You seem collected. What, what's going on there? So I told her that I was a pastor and was going to Grace Calvary Church. Michelle actually came out here a couple of times out to Grace Calvary. She's the one that has uh, Quinn, the son. But, um, but you never know who's watching us. 
In verses 17 through 21, Paul criticized not only the Judaizers, but also the self-indulgent Christians, people who claim to be Christians but don't live up to the model of servanthood and self-sacrifice. These people want to satisfy their own desires for thinking about their own needs and not thinking about others. Freedom in Christ does not mean freedom to be selfish. It means taking every opportunity to serve one another, to become the best person that we can be with the Lord Jesus Christ's help. Now the citizens of Philippi, they had some rights and privileges because they were citizens of Rome. Because Philippi was a Roman colony, likewise we as Christians will one day experience all the special privileges our heavenly citizenship has for us. Because we belong to Christ, let us not be so tired of this life that we would be sorry for Christ's return. I am looking forward to Christ's return and basking on the streets of gold. In verse 21, the phrase, the body of our humble state, does not imply any negative attitude toward our human body. However, the bodies that we will receive when we are raised from the dead will be glorious. They will be like Christ's resurrected body. Those who struggle with pain, physical limitations, disabilities, will have a wonderful hope in the resurrection. Again, I think of the people who have been paralyzed or wheelchairs, and they'll be able to run on the streets of gold up in paradise. Paul talks about what our resurrected bodies will be like. Paul explains that we will be recognized with our resurrected bodies, yet they will be better than we can even imagine, for they will be made to live forever. We will still have our own personalities and individualities, I think, because those will be perfected through Christ's work. The Bible does not reveal everything that we will have when we get to heaven, but we know that they will be perfect. We will be without sickness or diseases. There will be no more weeping and no more tears. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what do you value in life? Do you value coffee? Dunkin' Donuts? Starbucks? Wawa? Do you value clothes? Do you value cars? You will spend money acquiring them. I, I told you in the past, I love trains. I think the last time I counted, I think I have 15 train sets, including O and HO scales. But uh, I love them, so there's some money that's valued in them. We're actually, we're getting ready to set our trains underneath the Christmas tree. I already sandpapered the track and we're ready to go. Maybe you're a stamp collector, maybe you're a coin collector, maybe you have a hobby that you have a lot of stuff invested in. But maybe you also value integrity. Will you endeavor to be honest with people around you? Our world hits us with a lot of junk. Hits us with wealth, hits us with pleasure, possessions, entertainment, self-gratification. While much of the value is not necessarily bad in this world, but we need to um, measure the values with God's value. Does something need to change? Maybe instead of investing all this money in our hobbies and stuff, maybe we need to give some money to maybe Samaritan's Purse for a well. Maybe you can give to the organization to build the church. Maybe an orphanage. Uh, I just saw the Samaritan's Purse catalog, and there is a number of different things that you can give to. Um, I know also CBN with the uh, Operation Blessing, when there's a disaster happening, they're right there to try and help the people as much as they can. Maybe um, Cop- Com- Compassion International, supporting a child. We did that for years. There's a lot of different ways you can help support the mission field. So do you need to change something in your values? What do you consider to be loss? What do you consider to be a gain? Where do you find your sense of worth, your sense of importance, and your sense of acceptance? Hopefully it's all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants to change and help us prioritize our value system. 
and align it with his. So we do. We can go to God and say, God, if I'm not doing things right, if I'm not managing my money well, please help me, please guide me, protect me. And he'll do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you guys want to go ahead and do something with Samaritan's Purse, you can go online and check out all the different things that you can support. Um, again, we support, I think there's like 12 missionaries here at the church that we support. From Jews from Jesus to, you know, we pray for them on a monthly basis. Um, so praise God we can do that. But, you know, maybe you should try and do something at home. And like I said, really check your value system and align it up with the Lord Jesus Christ and see what's going on there. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do ask you that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would just show us the things that we have in our life to prioritize it according to your measure of value. Whether it is trying to buy someone a coat for Christmas, whether it's helping someone else to do a well, Lord Jesus, over in Africa, God, we thank you for this Operation Christmas Child where people can actually get a box and full of toys for kids, Lord God. We pray that they would continue to see the love of Christ, be able to accept you as Lord and Savior. So, Father, we just ask you for your continued blessing in all that we do. We thank you for the time that we had here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.